historian does. In a fragment for the mind of the tribe, the other missing chapter, which never made it to print, he wrote of the need to go beyond the major civilizations treated in his book, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Sumer, Assyria, Mycenae, Greece, and the Hebrews, to quote other, he wanted to go to other smaller agricultural civilizations, presumably by camera. That's a quote from him. Jaynes continued his interest in archaeology, and it was particularly enthusiastic about the work on China and bicamerality by Michael Carr, a protege of his. Jaynes' mind was far from dormant, and it did not deviate from his lifelong pursuit of answers to the puzzle of consciousness. Let us follow his journey. In 1977, he published The Remembrance of Things Past, spelling out, quote, a space of unhappening events of associations and experience through which we can move about in any direction. It is, of course, metaphor space. In 1978, his commentary on papers by animal psychologist Donald Griffith, David Premack, and Sue Savage Rumbaugh appeared. In it, he complained, quote, all three papers seem to say that because animal behavior can be made to simulate aspects of human behavior, Therefore, such animals are similar to human conscious fun functioning. It's the same argument used with that other method of cognitive processes, computer intelligence. But, to use a wildly dissimilar and probably inaccurate example, because Mickey Mouse looks and behaves so humanly on a screen, does not mean that a celluloid film is conscious. It means that he's made to look conscious. Jane's, 1978. Jane's argument cut deeper than animal analogies. It was a theory rooted in the evocative power of language to transform consciousness. Metaphor conveyed consciousness by spatializing, his novel term, the physical world. This claim required empirical evidence of all sorts, from archaeological to psychological. Yet the time scale was much too rapid for evolution physical or cultural. Hence, another novelty in his theory. This change occurred in only 600 years, from 1200 BC to 600 BC. He wrote a brief commentary called Paleolithic Cave Paintings as Eidetic Images in Brain and Behavioral Sciences in 1979. The Meaning of King Tut, The Dragons of the Shang Dynasty, The Visions of William Blake, all for Art World, he embraced interdisciplinarity, as few have done in our time. One feature of this interdisciplinary grasp of, of the past for Jaynes came from his religious roots. He was raised a Unitarian by his mother, Clara Bullard Jaynes, and he admired his father, the Reverend Julian Clifford Jaynes, a Unitarian minister whom he'd never really known. His father gained prominence as a minister in West Newton, but he had remarried late in life and died when Julian was only two. He died on the ferry crossing to PEI, where the family had a summer cottage, leaving a young wife in her 20s with three infant children, three children under the age of three. Julian read the books in his father's library, which used to be in West Newton, and migrated eventually to Keppoch by the sea. He browsed through the many and then ended up here at PEI, thanks to Scott Greer. He browsed through the many boxes of his father's sermons stored in the family's attic. You can imagine young Julian learning his Unitarianism through learning his father's mind in the attic. The heart of his theory comes from comparing the Old and New Testaments, a minister's son. In 1978, he lectured at Emory University in the Department of Religion. In Psalm 42, for example, he, wrote, he said, God is depicted as a commanding presence. As the heart pants after the water brook, my mind thirsts for God's living God's. When shall I come face to face with God? Psalm 42. Indeed, the bicameral mind is an obedient mind. By contrast, in the New Testament, John 2, we read, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall be in him as a well of water, springing up with ever everlasting life. The well inside you is consciousness, James explained. It is a metaphor, and thirst is the metaphor. Jesus, he added, was trying to reform Judaism. 
Julian was trying to reform Christianity. Perhaps the best clue to how Jaynes was developing his theory comes from his beloved undergraduate seminar, Psychology 319, The Psychology of Consciousness. He taught it from at least 1979 to 1992. He covered his own book in the first four weeks, then spent six more weeks going beyond it. Would that we had a tape of Julian's seminar. Would that I had been there. But I left Princeton in 1969. This course began in 1979. We have people in the room who knew Julian in the 1980s, Brian McVeigh in particular, whom I'll be tape recording soon. As a biographer, I want to capture any evidence I can of how Julian's mind and character developed. The first week of the course was called The Nature of Consciousness, Its Features and Modes. It drew on introductions to chapters in an anthology called Consciousness and the Brain, edited by Globus et al., 1976. It also drew on William James' Stream of Thought, 1890. I could mention more. Um, this is very selective, but his syllabus is direct evidence of what he was reading and teaching during this period, going beyond, but also building on the sources that he'd already used in his book. I've tried to pull out the new ones. In the second week, he turned to, quote, the bicameral mind, its neurology and evolution, again, based on his book. In addition to assigning the second half of book one and the first half of book two, he added J.E. Bogan's The Other Side of the Brain for a reading, and Ruth Lay's Emotion and the Right Hemisphere, 1981. He was deepening the lateralization thesis. He was also showing a film, Left Brain, Right Brain. In the third week, he covered the topic mind from 9000 BC to 1000 AD, marching the students through the second half of his own book two and the first half of book three. He also had them skim Amos and Ecclesiastes from the Bible to compare bi bicamerality as it evolved into consciousness. He finished off his book in week four, that is the students finished reading his book in week four, in a unit called Alterations of Consciousness in Hypnosis and Schizophrenia, which was in the final part of the book, assigning new material on hypnosis from Ernest Hilgard, 